To those of us in the know, this, this goes to the heart of our sustainable future. How this is handled will determine if the UK's sustainability ambitions come to pass. Because everything here, plastic, metal, paper, electronics, packaging, is made from finite resources. How they're preserved or returned to the supply chain is the key that will unlock the circular economy. And that, that is all down to you, the resources and waste management sector. Your unique position in the supply chain is a huge opportunity, one that's already transforming the industry, and one with the potential to protect our planet and improve all of our lives. Seize this moment, innovate, collaborate, be bold, and you will change the world. Leading the way to a world beyond waste is the vision of the Chartered Institution of Waste Management. It's a vision of the future where everything has a value, a future where we don't have waste. Because we'd have a ready supply of recycled materials, we'd extract fewer virgin resources. Products would last longer, and when they do reach end of life, their components retrieved and reused. The circular economy can revolutionise the resources and waste management sector, and you can see the change it's already brought. Without a doubt, we've come a huge distance and a hell of a long way from where the sector was in that old tape, make, dispose model. And we are recycling more, doing uh, far more innovative things and driving towards greater resource efficiency and towards that net zero and circularity that we're all striving towards. But there are many hurdles to overcome. We are talking huge volumes of material. And while the recycling rate has increased over the last 20 years, we need to do more. The circular economy perhaps first entered the public consciousness in 1970 when this man, Gary Anderson, came up with this simple design. It was for a competition by the Container Corporation of America, marking the inaugural Earth Day, and it won him a prize of $2,000. It is now one of the most recognised symbols in the world, synonymous with the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. Whilst the three R's were aimed at consumers, in the spirit of reuse, let us reimagine them to create five priorities for the resources and waste management industry. Five signposts, if you like, on the road to a world beyond waste. In the original three R's, the first R, reduce, referred to consumers reducing their use of materials. For us, it's about the reduction of carbon emissions. The sector already plays a huge role in reducing the 45% of global greenhouse gas emissions that come from how we make and use things. Yet, as concerns over climate change escalate, the spotlight is on all industries to reduce their own carbon emissions and their impact on the environment. So in terms of carbon emissions and climate change, the sector currently is responsible for around about 8% of direct carbon emissions in the UK. We don't produce the waste, but we manage the waste on behalf of the public and on behalf of businesses, and those are the hard figures. And we have to improve on that. However, we shouldn't overlook the fact that there has been a massive reduction in carbon emissions from this sector over the last 20 years of around 60% and more. This is our primary facility, the Bywaters Material Recovery Facility at Lee Riverside in East London. Our facility is one of the largest undercover MRFs um, in London. Um, we offer the whole plethora of waste management requirements for companies and take them on a sustainability journey as well to improve their performance. Increasing recycling efficiency and resource efficiency is paramount to a world beyond waste. But of course we need to think on how we can do that um, efficiently, cost effectively in line with net zero. The largest CO2 emitters in the waste sector is from landfill, energy from waste and composting. But we certainly have a responsibility to streamline our sector, whether it's the logistics and transport aspect um, or reducing um, and installing uh, renewable energies on, on our sites. And over the last 10 years, we've um, reduced emissions by 50%. Good afternoon, Ed. Hello, sir. How are you? Nice to see you again. How's the operation going today? How much waste has come through the gates? Well, we've so far today, Ed, we've had about 250 tonnes. You see that pile over there? We're probably going to capture around 90% of what you can see in that pile. 
Our operations are, are quite multifaceted, so we, we, we have to decarbonize and look for efficiencies at, at the various stages. So uh, decarbonization and electrification of the fleet. And we purchased a zero carbon energy tariff from April this year, and that works in conjunction with our 4000 panel array um, to, to reduce our carbon. How are we getting on with the solar panels on the roof? What, what sort of energy output are we getting today? I have an app on my phone, as one does these days. Production in the last few hours, 765 kilowatt hours. Right, so that's going to be around 30-ish percent of our use in the day then. That's very good. Our PV array took eight years to pay back. During the recent energy price spike, um, we've saved um, almost a quarter of a million pounds uh, per annum. Any non-recyclable waste that doesn't come to our MRF um, or anything that we don't capture in the MRF, we move via a third party on the River Thames and that goes to a best-in-class energy from waste plant in London. By using River, uh, you're sometimes not incurring any energy use with the tidal Thames. The Thames can hold a large volume of containerized waste and we're, we're taking heavy goods vehicles and bulk movements off of London's busy roads. One question that we often consider is, does implementing these reductions in carbon footprint, does that, does that affect operations? If we have a breakdown or a stoppage, especially because of changes in technology, that can affect our bottom line quite considerably, but that has not been our experience over the last 10 years or so. This is the future. And if you don't implement these changes, you will eventually hit a brick wall where you cannot continue with the old equipment that you currently have. Looking at the sustainability field as much as we do, um, we understand the crisis um, that we are in globally and we want to lead the way for our clients increasingly to stay relevant in the sector and attract business. We have to have a clear reduction pathway. Us uh, waste sector businesses as experts in the field and moving forward firmly with sustainability have the knowledge and the passion to speak to members of the public and our clients about sustainability and impart some of that information. We really are at um, a transition point in how we use energy and the whole plethora of things associated with sustainability. It's a very exciting time. The strides made by the resources and waste management sector to decarbonise its operations is something we can all celebrate. The sector's carbon footprint, already lower than most others, is evidence of an industry looking inwards to adapt and to innovate. But to achieve the next of our five R's requires the sector to look outwards, to the value chain of which it's part. Maybe I'm biased, but I would 100% say that design is literally where it starts and where it ends. A poor decision, early stage, can have massive implications later on about 80% of any product's environmental impact is decided at the design stage. Design isn't just about the glamorous, glitzy stuff or interior design, nice sofas, nice cars. Packaging design is, is a massively key one. Something as, as simple as a PET bottle, which everyone thinks is, well, it's been around for decades, nice and simple. It's changed quite a lot over the last sort of last decade or even last four or five years. It has been quite rare for brands and retailers and manufacturers to, to seek out advice from the resource industry, but it's been changing quite significantly over the last few years. This line runs at 36,000 bottles an hour. On average, we'll do about two and a half million bottles a week, uh, up to about a peak demand of about three million every week. It's an awful lot of bottles going somewhere. So yeah, we've got a lot of great consumers, fortunately. So this is our final product, so this is the Ribena 500ml RTD bottle that was redesigned in 2020. So Suntory Beverage and Food GB&I are one of the UK's largest soft drinks companies. Sustainability is an integral part of the Ribena brand and that's why since 2007 we've been using 100% recycled plastic in our bottles. And although our on-the-go bottles were 100% recyclable, they were typically not being recycled over and over again into other plastic bottles. This is the original Ribena bottle, so you can see the shape. Uh, we used to put a full length sleeve on this, on this bottle. It's all about how recyclable that bottle was. So when it gets to waste recycling, it would potentially see it as coloured plastic. 
So, and ideally we want it to be seen as clear plastic for that bottle then to come back into the you know, circular economy. We decided to start the redesign process to increase the bottle circularity. It was a lot of collaboration with waste experts right at the early stage of the, of the design process. Centauri came to us realising that their bottle wasn't being recycled in a circular way. Coming to, to people like us at RAP is, is a great way of getting some good impartial advice. Our goals are to make sure that that resources are used effectively and that does mean making sure that packaging is, is recyclable. So our advice is to change the size of the sleeve to make it a maximum of 40% of the bottle coverage so it gives enough of the bottle to be visible for the NIR detectors to detect it and then also potentially change the polymer label so it was compatible with the recycling as well. When Suntory Ribena came to us of course, they would have been working with all the um, different organisations, RAP for example, to make sure that they were getting all the right information to create a brief that worked for designers. One of the key challenges with a big shrimp, mm. shrink wrap is that <laughs> they don't go down the line so effectively. So I guess that was the main yeah. starting point of the brief, was how can we reduce this, this label size down to something that's going to allow these material recycling facilities to categorise that plastic in a correct way. It's an incredibly complex system that comes together to such a beautiful and sort of simple product that we have in our lives every day and a brand that we love. We're really proud of this design. I think it's a great result from a great collaboration. In our vision of the future, redesign is a collective effort. Leading the way to a world beyond waste means resources and waste management professionals are involved in the design planning stage. They're in the room shaping the decisions made. I'd love to see the waste sector initiating the conversation with design more. Um, I think part of it is understanding what we do as designers and, and our impact on, on their, you know, their industry. I think another part of it is, is gaining the right kind of data that we can use to, to put into our design process to make sure that we're making great decisions at the design stage. But certainly I love that dialogue to grow and improve. The way Ribena did it was it was almost the perfect way. They, they engaged us straight away at the start of the journey rather than making assumptions and they are getting the feedback from, from the waste management resource industry to make sure that, it is, that they're happy with it and it's going to work through the MRFs and PERFs and the other recycling infrastructure too. After design, the next critical aspect of the circular economy is keeping products in the supply chain longer, pushing back the need for disposal. Refurbishment and repair of products is a growing market and vital to a world beyond waste. So what I think was interesting about kind of waste management, we can think about it again as lots of different stages around the circular economy. So we can think about it at the very end of life where things are recycled, which is literally destruction. What we really want to do is kind of pull it further back and go, how can we repair it? How can we refurbish it? There are many examples of how that kind of pulling away from the end of life to middle of life and creating second, third, fourth lives are actually very, very, very impactful. So our sector is incredibly well placed when it comes to refurbishment and stuff because we've got the knowledge, the expertise, the stuff that we've been doing for decades now. We can take those computers that are no longer working, we can then move them into an area which then can they can be re repaired, replaced, refurbished. So they're like new stuff and then we can sell them on again, making sure that they are staying within the economy as long as possible. Hey Ivor. How are you doing all right? What are you up to today? Which we take at an IT lifecycle services company and we offer clients a service to dispose of, recycle and refurbish the redundant IT equipment. Retech was founded in 1996 and initially focused on the redistribution and disposition of used integrated circuit boards and memory and RAM. As the market started to evolve, Retech spotted a gap in the market whereby uh, there was a demand for uh, refurbished ICs, RAM and, and, and memory modules. Clients really started to focus on uh, what they do with the e-waste and really the, the market started to open up for, for, for Retech to offer those kind of services. So refurbishment plays a really important role within the circular economy. So within our most recent study for CIWM, where we tried to predict how many roles will be required right the way until 2040, by far the biggest growth in roles was around reuse and repair, and we predicted 140,000 additional roles in this area the vast majority of which would actually be around e-waste and the refurbishment of electrical and electronic goods. So over the last three years, uh, we have 
we used uh, upwards of one million items that otherwise would have been sent for recycling. So we've been able to take these items, laptops, PCs, TFT servers, uh, refurbish them, uh, clean them, and then make them available for resale to extend their life cycle. We have a reuse rate in, in, in total uh, of well above 90%. We strive towards a zero landfill policy, so there's very little equipment that we cannot either uh, repair fully and refurbish and resell, or at least break down into commodity level and, and, and recycle at that point. By trying to keep those resources flowing in our economy for longer, we have to look at them in a different way. We have to work with different stakeholders within our sector. We have to get closer to designers, to manufacturers. That presents a great opportunity for our sector because actually we can showcase the vast skills and resources that we have in supporting other industries to become more circular. Clients are now more focused than ever on CSR and ESG reporting as part of uh, any organisation they engage with. My message to other organisations would be to fully, uh, fully adopt that and embrace it when it comes to dealing with clients. Until you come into a place like Retech, People don't really realise just how many items we consume that really we, we should be focusing on reusing where possible, repairing and then on back into the circular economy. Working in retail for almost 15 years, I get experience this first hand where I see the number of devices coming in a daily, weekly, monthly and annual basis and it gives me, it gives me a tremendous sense of uh, satisfaction to see the, the, the difference we make when it comes to, when it comes to reusing this stuff. When things do come to the end of life, we need to ensure materials are extracted, losing minimum quality and being returned to the supply chain as efficiently as possible. The industry is pushing forward with the development of new technologies that will play a key role in enhancing these efficiencies as well as creating a more transparent supply chain. We're seeing all sorts of exciting things happening in the sector and some very smart people deploying very smart technology to drive towards a greater circular economy. Data and other innovations, but data especially, have a key role to play in driving us towards greater recycling levels, greater resource efficiency. We're just arriving now at the Goffa Balking Centre in Conwy in North Wales and we've got one of our units installed here. So I'm excited to see how they've been getting on. Recycling rates in the UK have been static for the last 11 years at around 44%, depending on whose data you look at. In order to really see a, a significant step change and improvement in those recycling rates, I believe you have to introduce digital transformation to that arena in order to see significant improvement in the recycling rates. And that's what Polytag brings. Here we are. Here we are. Where the magic happens. <laughs> Let's go and have a look. And the Polytag kit is just step over in the corner here. Everything's running perfectly, no issues at all. Just picking up the data that we need. No issues from our perspective. Brilliant. At the heart of our technology um, is a solution that we've developed for the brands um, that produce single-use plastic. The manufacturers and suppliers have currently got no information that tells them where the packaging is disposed of and where it's recycled. And we're able to show them at barcode level information they've never seen before. Suddenly it's unlocked a lot of decision making possibilities. Polytag works by putting a unique code identifier on a piece of packaging. The two code structure that we, we have developed, which is the unique one time code, which goes onto the packaging, but also the static UV data matrix code as the consumer scans the human readable code to redeem deposits through the Bower app. And then as the material is placed into the curbside recycling system, when it uh, arrives at a MRF, we have our simple retrofitted piece of hardware that just the rest is the UV data matrix codes. And all this correlates to our, our brand dashboards and allow, enables our brand uh, stakeholders to have really rich data sets you know, available to them. Oh, look, there's one of our bottles. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. It's one of our bottles with a QR code on it. Um, hopefully that's already been uh, scanned and redeemed by the consumer and they've had their 20 pence reward. And as you know, the entire label is covered in a grid of UV tags. And when this bottle goes along further down the conveyor belt, it will be identified by our hardware and the co-op will get an extra count saying one of their bottles has been successfully recycled. 
co-op is about 6% of the UK grocery market, um, but co-op alone, even though it's only 6%, makes up over 100,000 tonnes of packaging placed on the market every year. And it's important for us as a member-owned organisation that cares about um, the environment and the people and the planet to know where our packaging ends up. And that would be a game changer to be able to uh, account for every single piece of packaging that goes onto the market. It has some really profound implications for what could happen with waste management in the future. Using technology has the potential to help Wales deliver on its recycling ambitions. Um, traceability throughout the supply chain um, will reinforce future regulatory changes really. The Polytag UV tag reader was retrospectively fitted to our plastic conveyor without issue. Through monitoring the analytics via the Polytag dashboard that we do have here at Conway, um, we have access to the real-time data including where, when and, and how the packaging has been recycled through our facility and that helps us to optimise our waste strategy going forward. So like all big producers, we're obligated by the 2007 Producer Responsibility Regulations for packaging waste. We will be further obligated by the waste reforms that are happening at the moment that are due to land around 2025. Imagine the possibilities if every single piece of packaging could be tagged and traced. Imagine what that could do for the future of recycling in the UK. Now, we've come to the last of our five R's. Repurpose. Not all materials that come to end of life can be recycled, but in a world beyond waste, that doesn't mean that they can't have value. Repurposing organic waste and turning it into energy, for example, is an increasingly important source of clean energy in the UK. So there's a huge opportunity for us as an industry to have an impact on, on the UK's energy output, especially when it comes to, to food waste and what we do with that. So, so using anaerobic digestion to AD. Um, at the moment in the UK, only about 50% of households have food waste collections. So that's only about 50% of the food waste that's out there being captured and then be, being used to, to create energy through these technologies. Welcome to Energy and Biogas Anaerobic Digestion Facility in Cumbernauld. I'm George O'Malley, the General Manager for Biocapital Scotland. I'm covering three facilities of which Energy and Biogas is one. Biocapital is a, an investment group predominantly focused on anaerobic digestion. We have eight facilities across the UK uh, as well as a collection business. The collective energy capability of Biocapital currently is the equivalent energy used to power and heat 50,000 homes. Currently we are in the top three renewable energy producers in the UK and Northern Ireland. Anaerobic digestion has increased in scale significantly over the last few years. There's now 615 anaerobic digestion plants across the UK. Anaerobic digestion is a biological process where microorganisms break down organic matter such as food waste, farm slurries, energy crops and produce a biogas and a nutrient-rich biofertiliser, an ideal replacement for synthetic fertiliser, which is responsible for 2% of global emissions. The biogas can be further processed to produce vehicle fuel, can be cleaned up in order to produce clean gas, which is directly injected to the grid after the addition of propane, decarbonising the gas grid, and the biogas itself is combusted to produce electricity. Hi Stephen, how are you doing? Hi George, I'm good, thanks. When I first started, it was quite a, a new thing. I didn't know a lot of people that had a background in anaerobic digestion. But ever since I've started here, it's been expanding. A lot of interest from waste producers who are looking for another outlet for their waste that's more environmentally friendly. As we're involved in the, the process on a day-to-day -day basis, you can easily see how the food waste is brought in and how none of it actually goes to waste. All either ends up as biogas or as a fertiliser that can go back onto the land. This is very important for a circular economy. It's also important for meeting the government's targets for net zero. If the food waste processed at this anaerobic digestion facility wasn't repurposed here, it would inevitably find its way to an energy from waste plant or, worst case, landfill. It's extremely important for the, the UK to achieve the net zero targets that this material is diverted to solutions such as anaerobic digestion. The waste sector can influence this by promoting the good work that we do, working with strategic partners such as local authorities, food waste producers, other waste businesses in order to divert organic matter from traditional waste disposal methods to green closed loop solutions like biocapitals.
It's a win-win by using uh, food waste to make energy, so removing it from landfill, uh, which is a huge, huge impact that it has in terms of our emissions as an industry, uh, and then putting it back into something where we can get something back out of it. It's a win-win, it's a benefit for all, all involved. The world beyond waste may at times feel a faraway place. There's certainly a long way to go, but it is a destination that is within our grasp, and one with, as I hope, we've shown a clear roadmap for how to get there. We will need to cement the sector's role at the very heart of the circular economy if we are to accelerate the reduction of carbon locked up in goods and services. We're going to need governments to provide a clear policy framework, consumers to actively engage with the proper disposal and processing of waste, producers to embrace circularity, designers to reimagine their creations, builders to create the infrastructure we'll need. But most of all, achieving a world beyond waste depends on you, how you embrace this vision, Harness the innovation at your disposal. Collaborate within and beyond your sector. A zero waste society is achievable in the UK and it could serve as a model for other countries to strive for. Those five new R's, in addition to the traditional three R's, you could perhaps add the one that comes across the top, uh, the top of all of them, and that's rethink. Rethink some of the consumer behaviour, rethink some of the products that are produced and put onto the market, and of course rethink what we do as a sector. So circularity is very complicated and very, very difficult, but there are so many examples of businesses across many sectors that are taking on the challenge and doing it at the best they can now. The sector should be so proud of the work we're doing. I think without us, lots of things just do not become possible. There's not many industries that adapt as well and as quick as, as our industry does. Get this right now and the benefits will be felt across society not just through the reduction of waste and raw materials, but in terms of job creation, technological advancement, and a more collaborative economy. This opportunity is huge. The only question we have to ask is, are you ready to seize it?